Okay. We are going to be going over drug regimen review conducted with follow-up for identified issues. This is a very lengthy section. It deals with three separate questions. And so, thank you, ma'am. For that reason, we are going to cover the first section, and then we'll break, and after lunch, we will finish. Okay? So there isn't a clearly defined, you know, question slide, but we are going to stop roughly 40% of the way through so that you can get a rest, have your lunch, and then come back refreshed, I hope, and I will try to make sure everybody stays awake in the after lunch lull. <clears throat> okay. So our goal for this presentation, before and after lunch, is to complete at the end, to be able to define terminology so that you'll understand what goes into the numerator, the denominator, the, what, what episodes are excluded, and how your percentages are going to be calculated. We really want you to be comfortable and have a working knowledge of what's included in 2001, the drug regimen review itself, 2003, the medication follow-up, and 2005, the medication intervention. As we go through this material, you will be comfortable with the intent of each of the three questions. You'll be able to understand and interpret the responses for each one of these three. You'll follow the instructions so that you can accurately respond to the scenarios and then go back and teach them. And we will also look at resolving some of the common stumbling blocks that, are in, that you will have in coding these items. Once again, we have a group of acronyms on these slides and I will leave it to you to go through them and make sure that you are providing clear definition and consistent common usage for all of these different acronyms in your own agency. Okay. Again, a reminder, when I say that we are using the term code or coding, we're referring to how you respond to or score the different OASIS items. I don't want anyone confusing this with actual ICD-10 coding. As we go through this, <clears throat> I want to call your attention to the terminology. We are using the term drug regimen review. Notice what it's not saying. This is not med rec. As we go through, I want to point out the differences in the definition between drug regimen review and med rec because there truly are differences. And when you answer these questions, you are looking at a comprehensive drug regimen review. The reason that we do this as an assessment-based cross-setting quality measure is, first of all, it is part of the Impact Act, but it is looking at how responsive you are to the potential or actual clinically significant medication issues that exist in your patient's situation when these are identified. We are applying this measure uniformly across all the different post-acute settings. So what's the basis for this measure? We are reporting the percentage of patient care episodes in which the drug regimen was reviewed at the start of care, at resumption of care, and a timely follow-up with the physician occurred each time that a potentially clinically significant issue was identified throughout the whole care episode. So there are some several different terms in this very long sentence that we're going to need to be able to identify and define and have an agreement on the definition. 
in order for this data to be valid and useful to us. So let's take a look at how the numerator and the denominator are going to be defined in doing this calculation. The numerator applies to the number of quality episodes where the agency conducted a drug regimen review at start or resumption of care or the patient is not taking any medications. And in number two, it also includes episodes where if a potentially clinically significant medication issue were identified at any time during the quality episode, then the agency contacted a physician or physician designee, completed the prescribed or recommended actions by midnight of the next calendar day in response to those issues throughout the quality episode. The denominator is the number of quality episodes ending with a discharge or transfer to an inpatient facility or death at home during the reporting period. Okay? Uh, have we, are we comfortable and clear with those, the numerator and the denominator? Because we want to be sure that everyone understands what those are. There are no quality episodes excluded from the denominator, and this measure is not risk-adjusted or stratified in any way. What's included in this quality measure? We have three separate questions here. 2001, the drug regimen review was done. 2003, medication follow-up, the issue identified was responded to. And 2005, the intervention was completed. If the data is missing on any of these items, that we need to calculate the numerator, then that patient episode will not be included in the numerator count. You would need to enter a dash to indicate missing information. The patient would be included in the denominator count, however, assuming that all denominator criteria for that patient have been met. Now we get down to the math, never my favorite part. To calculate the denominator, in the home health setting, they calculate the number of episodes that ended that right-hand bracket with a discharge, transfer, or death at home assessment. The numerator includes those episodes, the total number of episodes in the denominator where the medical record contains documentation of a drug regimen review conducted at the start or resumption of care and a discharge with a look back through the entire episode so that you are looking at all potentially clinically significant medication issues that have been identified, followed up with the physician or designee, by midnight of the next calendar day. Okay, so that's your denominator, your numerator and your denominator. The calculation is done by dividing the numerator by the denominator to get your observed score. In other words, you divide two by one. So now we're going to take a look at these questions. And we are going to define the different components that I called to your attention before, because it is those definitions that will help to determine which episodes are included in the numerator and the denominator. <clears throat> so question 2001 is, did a complete drug regimen review identify Potential clinically significant medication issues. This is a question that was revised. And so we're going to begin by looking at how it was changed. In the original, 
M2000, you can see just looking at the page, it was significantly longer. It used to read, does a complete drug regimen review indicate potential clinically significant medication issues, for example, adverse drug reactions, ineffective therapy, significant side effects, drug interactions, duplicate therapy, et cetera, et cetera. The new question reads, did a complete drug regimen review identify potential clinically significant medication issues? What they have done is they have given you credit for knowing what the definition is. This is what the question used to look like. Notice that there are four different options here for the answers. Originally, you had a choice of not assessed. No problems found, problems found, patient is not taking any medications. In the new question, the revised version gives you the choice of no issues found, issues were found, or the patient is not taking any medications. They have eliminated the option for not assessed. Thank God. Because what kind of a health assessment at starter resumption of care would we be doing if we did not do a thorough drug regimen review? That is not safe patient care by any means. So an overview of the changes tells us that they've removed all the examples from the item stem. Not assessed, not reviewed is no longer an option. Thank you. There have been some wording changes in the response options. They changed the word problem to issue. And the not applicable response is now Nine, not applicable. Our goal here, the intent, is to make sure that we are identifying if any, the review of the patient's medication regimen indicated any potential clinically significant medication issues. And we are doing this at start of care and at resumption of care. So let's take a little a look at what exactly we're doing. What are the potential clinically significant issues that might arise? A medication interaction is defined as the impact of another substance upon a medication. And there's a long list here of what kinds of substances might be involved. The interactions that might be caused are that it might alter the absorption, distribution, metabolism, or elimination of the medication. It might decrease the effectiveness or increase the potential for adverse consequences. When you look at what types of substances it might be, it's logical that other medications might impact one another. Nutritional substances such as herbal products Foods, or the diagnostic dyes and pieces that are used in determining what other systems are being affected. I want to share with you a little story about herbal supplements that draws the impact very clear. And it's highly personal for me. I saw it happen, and I couldn't believe that it was happening right in front of my own eyes. A long time ago, thank God, my daughter was diagnosed with Hodgkin's disease. She was very young. She was 22. And the large oncology group that she went to was scheduling the appointments for the chemo sessions. They stratified them by age group so that their patients would essentially have a support group of their peers when they were there for chemo so they could really support one another. It was a great idea. It had an unintended consequence. An incident occurred where they noticed that a group of patients who were coming for chemo every Tuesday, that their labs were, to put it as the nurse told me, their labs are going to heck in a handbasket. They are not, this is not, something's wrong. 
And so they started interviewing each of the patients and doing a health history, finding out, What's, what are you doing? And my daughter was one of them. And it turned out one of the young women in the group had been told by a family member that she should absolutely be taking St. John's wort. It's an all-natural herbal supplement. It's not going to hurt you. It will help to improve your immunity. You won't get colds. You won't get infections, yada, yada, yada. And because the young woman loved and trusted her auntie, she decided she was going to buy St. John's wort, and she felt fine, so she went back to chemo the following session, told everybody in her group she was taking it, and she felt great. Next thing you know, all kinds of them are taking it. Next thing that happens is everybody's labs are in the toilet, including my daughter's. And that's what they tracked it back to. Now, if you asked a patient, are you taking any other medications, by phrasing your question that way, you're not going to get that information, are you? And so it's all about how you conduct that patient interview. It's all about how you ask the question. So please, for the sake of your patient's safety, for the sake of making sure that nothing untoward happens, please make sure that you teach your nurses to ask this question appropriately. Please show me, Mrs. Jones, everything that you are taking. I want to see all the vitamins, all the herbal supplements. I just need to make sure that they're not going to have a bad reaction with something else that you're already taking. It's critically important. An adverse reaction may be a secondary effect of a medication that is usually undesirable and different from the intended therapeutic one. It could be a response to a medication that is noxious and unintended and incurs in doses that are intended for prophylaxis, diagnosis, or treatment. A side effect is something that is expected and well-known, occurs with reasonable frequency, and may or may not constitute an adverse event. A side effect is often used interchangeably with advanced, ad, adverse drug reaction. They fall into five different categories. So you want to make sure that you're using, at, you know, certainly take advantage of these slides to go through with your staff the definitions so they'll be comfortable with what they need to know. A drug regimen review is considered to include Medication reconciliation, a review of all medications the patient is using, and a review of the drug regimen to identify and prevent, if possible, those potential clinically significant medication issues. So here we are. A drug regimen review is considered to include medication reconciliation. We very often tend to use these terms interchangeably and they are not. Medication reconciliation is quite literally, here's my list from the skilled facility or the hospital or the physician's office. Over here, I have that infamous brown paper bag or that shoe box that the patient says to you, yep, here they are. You asked to see all my meds, here they are. And when you ask them what they're taking, they say, well, all of them. But a Medication reconciliation is taking all those things the patient has in the house, lining it up against that, that information from your referral source. Here's what the physician says they're supposed to be taking, and here is what they are actually taking, so that you will know what they're supposed to be doing. You line those two up. That is med rec. It is not a drug regimen review. A drug regimen review is clearly more than that. It includes the med rec, but it also is looking at the interaction, requiring you to run that on your electronic record. You should all have a button or something that you can push that will run a medication interaction and risk so that you'll know what the adverse side effects, the interactions, the reactions might be from the combinations that you've got. And that's going to help to feed you 
to determine whether or not you have the potential for a clinically significant medication issue. So I really wanted to be sure that you were clear and comfortable about the difference between those two things. That drug regimen review includes, as I said, it includes all the medications prescribed and over-the-counter. And it also includes the TPN and the herbals. So while you may not be directly administering the TPN, you do need to have the formula. You need to know what's in it. It should be in your plan of care. It should be in your medications. Otherwise, how are you going to know if there is a high amount of magnesium in the TPN, but the patient's also taking a, sup a supplement that the physician, some other physician ordered, who's not the one who ordered the TPN. So now you're going to have a problem. That's the reason why you need to make sure that you have the content. You want to be sure you include what medications are being administered by any route, oral, topical, inhalers, pumps, injections, IVs, and enteral or G-tubes. You need to know anything and everything that is being absorbed or taken in by your patient. How are we defining a potential clinically significant medication issue? Now, here's where it gets a little sticky. This is an issue that in the care provider's clinical judgment requires physician or physician-designee notification by midnight of the next calendar day. So if you went out and did your sock rock assessment at 9 o'clock this morning, you have until midnight on Friday to identify that interaction, to get a hold of the physician or designee, and find out what they want to do about it. But if you didn't get to that admission or they had to do a same day and they didn't get home till 3 o'clock this afternoon, you still only have until midnight of tomorrow. No, oh, come on, move ahead there. In addition to what potential issues you might have found, you also need to include identifying an existing significant medication issue that requires physician notification. That's why you run that check in your electronic system for interactions between the medications. It's going to pop up and say to you, you have no risk, low risk, medium risk, high risk, red flag, do something about this. So you're going to need to run that and make sure that you have not only the potential but the already existing ones. And we've talked about what those might be. The adverse reactions, ineffective therapy, so an analgesic that doesn't re eliminate or reduce the pain. Perhaps one medication is interfering with the effectiveness of another. Side effects, the anticoagulants, they cause the bruising and the nosebleeds and the gum bleeding. Interactions. Drug to drug, drug to food, and drug to disease exacerbation or failure to accomplish their goal. You have the possibility of duplicate therapy, especially when you have multiple physicians or when you have that lovely error that so many of our patients make because in pure innocence, when they were in the, before they went in the hospital, they were taking their low presser religiously. They understood perfectly that little round white pill was supposed to be taken every morning, and that was their low presser for their blood pressure. They got it. Low presser, blood pressure, got it. Okay, so now they go to the hospital. They come home four days later, clutching in their hand their brand new script for metoprolol. And they dutifully send out their son to get it filled, who comes back and says, okay, dad, take this every morning. That's what the bottle says. Okie dokie. And because your patient wants to be compliant, this morning before you got there, he took his low presser like he always did, and he took that metoprolol that he can't pronounce. 
And when you get there and he stands up and tries to walk across the room to open the front door, you find him on the floor because his blood pressure is in the toilet because he did exactly what he thought he was supposed to do. That is duplicate therapy, and it's not his fault. He didn't understand generic and brand. What about drugs that are missing? Transcription errors occur. They didn't need something in the hospital that they've always taken at home, and now they need to restart taking it again. Dosage errors do occur, even from the pharmacy, not just on the part of the patient or a family member pre-filling. Dosage errors do occur. And last but not least, there's always non-adherence. We try to say, stay away from non-compliance if we can and use the term non-adherence. So the clinician who's responsible for completing the start or resumption OASIS assessment needs to verify and enter the information on the drug regimen review findings. If you have multiple disciplines going in, if you are completing your assessment over the five-day period for the start, over 48 hours for the resumption, it's very important that communication occur between the clinicians. It's, this is something that is allowed. It is going to happen. But clinical collaboration is an important part of what we do. So one clinician assumes the responsibility for completing the OASIS assessment tool, but they can collaborate with another person if portions of that assessment have been delegated to another agency staff member. Collaboration, where the assessing clinician evaluates the patient's status and another agency clinician assists with the review of the medication list does not violate the requirement that the assessment is the responsibility of and must ultimately be completed by one clinician. Collaboration does not violate that requirement. If your clinician is out in the home, does the assessment, gathers the information, calls the office and says to you as the supervisor or the quality manager, please run the med check, let me know if there's a problem, and by the way, can you call the doctor because I've got four more visits. This is absolutely appropriate. That is collaboration. You run the check, you track down the doc, and then you call that nurse in the field and say, here's the problem, and here's the solution. That is appropriate collaboration, and absolutely, it, it can be done. You need to have policy and procedure to determine the process and how it's going to be implemented and how it will be documented. The Moon 90 date, the date the assessment is completed, would be the date that the two clinicians collaborated and finalized the assessment and the information. So let's move on to the actual question itself, and we'll practice just a bit before I let you go have your lunch. This is what the question looks like. There are the three answers that we looked at before. The no, no issues were found, yes, issues were found, and the not applicable patient is not taking any medications. Based on your clinician's clinical judgment and their drug regimen review, the clinician will decide in these situations whether or not response zero, no issue found, should be entered. For example, the patient's list of medications from the inpatient facility discharge instructions matches the medications that the patient shows the clinician during the assessment visit. The assessment shows that the diagnoses and symptoms for which the patient is taking these medications are adequately controlled as they are able to be assessed within the clinician's scope of practice. It's a very important phrase. Based on the clinical judgment, the clinician can say the response is zero, no issues were found, if the patient has in their possession all the medications that were ordered. They have a plan for taking them safely. 
and the patient shows no signs or symptoms that could be adverse reactions caused by that medication list. When would you say, yes, there are issues? Based on your clinician's review, if the list of medications on the discharge instructions does not match that infamous brown paper bag and shoebox that came out from under the bed, if it doesn't match what the patient's been routinely taking and says they intend to take, then definitely we have an issue. If your assessment shows that the symptoms are not adequately controlled based on their assessment, then you definitely have an issue. Again, it is an issue if your patient is clearly confused about when and how to take the medications because this indicates a risk for error. If they have not obtained their medications, if they indicate to you that they will probably not take them because financially they can't get them, there's no one to go get them for them, culturally they don't approve of taking whatever this particular medication might be, or they have other issues. They have a personal problem or issue with taking opioids. My nephew's addicted. I won't touch those drugs. You can just take them and flush them, because if you don't, I will. And they're grimacing, wincing, and not standing up. We have a conflict here. This is a medication issue that needs to be resolved. You're going to use question, you're going to use option one. If the patient is taking multiple non-prescription, over-the-counter medications that interact with prescribed medications. There's that St. John's ward again. I think of it every time I walk down the aisle in the drugstore and I see it. What about a patient who has a very complex medication regimen and multiple prescribers and multiple pharmacies? Now we have a very high risk for a problem. It's critical that every physician involved in the patient's care has a complete list. And yes, we all know when you send the complete list of all the medications to the orthopod that did the knee replacement, he's going to jump up and down and say, I did not order the insulin, I did not order the thyroid medication, I did not order, I did not order, I'm not signing for those. The answer to that is, FYI, your patient is taking your signature only applies to those medications you have ordered. Now you can say, I told you, and here's the interaction list. And do the same thing with the general medical, the internist, who ordered the rest of it. But you have a responsibility to make sure that each physician involved in the plan of care is fully informed because that complex medication regimen with multiple prescribers and multiple pharmacies is an accident waiting to happen. Any one of these is going to reach that level of clinical significance that warrants notifying the physician or physician designee to get clarification of orders and recommendations for what they need, want you to do. And that notification needs to happen by midnight of the next calendar day. Any circumstance, something you identify that's a minimal or no risk is not considered a potential or actual clinically significant medication issue, so therefore you would not check off yes and you would not have that requirement to notify the physician. So when would you use a DASH here? This is a valid response. But remember, a dash value means no information is available or an item could not be assessed. The definition remains that this occurs when the patient is unexpectedly transferred, discharged, or dies before the assessment is completed. However, you should absolutely complete the transfer discharge assessment to the best of your ability when this happens, because Medicare expects that this will be a very rare occurrence. 
This patient assessment, the drug regimen review, is required by the conditions of participation currently 484.55. The location of that will change in the new COPs. You're going to find drug information and symptomology assessment in the clinical record, in the communication notes, in the assessment documentation, the med profile list, and clinical collaboration with other agency staff who may have assisted in or actually done the drug regimen review on site. So you want to be sure that you are looking at all these different places to try to get your information. Medication issues are going to continue to evolve and occur when new medications are being approved for the, you know, in the system, they become available. Patients get new orders all the time. It's important that you have, again, a current authoritative source for detailed medication information. So we're back to that. What is your validated resource for your nurses to use? A PDR or other clinical medication handbook or software intended to provide warning of severity levels can be used. CMS OASIS Q&As can be accessed, and there are several other online resources that you can use. I will offer up one suggestion that I have seen several agencies do. It seems that these days, hardly anyone is tooting around out there without some kind of a phone. Everybody's got a phone. Just about all of them can put an app on it. Do the research. Take a look for a validated, appropriate resource for your medication resource information, for a validated resource to check the meds. If you find, the, I, when I did the last search, I found about eight of them that were free. The others had some charges, nominal and on up, but there were at least eight that were free. You can get those, have your nursing staff load them on their phones, have your PT and OT load them on their phones, and then there is absolutely no reason why they can't validate or check something, especially if what your EMR spits out is still leaving the hair on the back of their neck up. You want them to have the resources, not just for sock and rock, but for the whole episode of care. And that is one way to do it. Even though you'll have something embedded in your EMR, you still want to look at providing whatever resources you can. Okay, we have a few minutes left. I'm standing between you and your lunch, I know. Let's do some practice scenarios quickly so that we can cover this, and then you can all head off to lunch, and we'll finish dealing with this later. So here's your first scenario. During the assessment visit, the PT reviews all the patient's medications and identifies no problems except the patient's newly prescribed pain medication is not yet in the home. The daughter states they were only going to pick it up from the pharmacy if the pain got bad enough. The PT emphasizes the need to comply with the physician instructions for new medication, and prior to the PT leaving, the daughter went to the drugstore and returned with the medication. So how would you respond? No issues found. Issue found. Not applicable. Patient not taking any meds. Or a dash. Let's use your clickers quickly. Decide which one you think is the correct answer. Look at that. Okay, the correct answer is no issues found because during the course of that visit, the daughter actually went to the pharmacy, picked up the medication, and before the therapist left, the med was in the home, allowing the opportunity to do the teaching, which meant that the physician or designee did not need to be contacted. Okay. During a com comprehensive visit, the nurse reviews all the medications and identifies that the meds have been ordered by several different physicians. 
These also included eye drops and topical ointments. The patient reports she takes several herbal supplements, but isn't sure if her physician is aware that she takes them. The RN determines this to be a potential clinically significant medication issue. She discusses with the patient the importance of consulting with her physician prior to taking over-the-counter supplements or medications. So how would you respond this time? No issue found. Issue found. Patient not taking any medications or a dash. Take your clicker, decide A, B, C, or D. Okay, I see hands on clickers. We're all set here. Yes? Okay, 97% issue found. And that's the correct answer. Because the nurse has identified in her clinical judgment that this patient has A, medications ordered from multiple physicians presenting the risk of a drug interaction. And secondly, the patient is taking herbal supplements that could interfere with prescribed medications, and although it's not on here, she doesn't know if her physician is aware of them. Third scenario, and I think this might be our last one. As part of the comprehensive assessment visit, the nurse has done her drug regimen review. She notes that there are medication discrepancies. The patient's list of medications includes warfarin. The patient's in-home medication list includes aspirin. The patient states she intends to take both warfarin and aspirin. However, she also reports she's been experiencing nosebleeds. The RN determines this to be a potential clinically significant medication issue. Patient also states she does not take any over-the-counter or herbal medications, and she is able to manage her medications independently. So now how will you answer this one? No issues. Issue found. Patient is not taking any medications or enter the DASH. Okay, select A, B, C, or D, and we'll see how we did this time. Excellent. 100%. This was definitely an issue, right? We have here the duplication. The list does not match from the facility and what was in the home. The patient intends to take both the warfarin and the aspirin, and she's already having nosebleeds. So in this situation, you would be checking off the yes, number one, issues were found. And we're going to stop here. I'm going to turn this podium back over to Ann for the moment. And we'll pick up here when we return from lunch. Okay, how are we doing there? Did everybody get coffee? Look like you all had at least some outside time. I understand it got a little bit muggy out there, but the sun is shining, so can't be all bad, right? Okay. We're going to pick up where we left off. We're going to go back to M2003, dealing with the issue of the medication follow-up. <clears throat> the actual verbiage for the question is, did the agency contact a physician or physician designee by midnight of the next calendar day and complete the prescribed recommended actions in response to the identified potential clinically significant medication issues. So as we did with the first question, we're going to compare it side by side to its predecessor. In OASIS C1, 2002 read as follows. Was a physician or physician designee contacted within one calendar day to resolve the clinically significant medication issues, including reconciliation? The new wording for OASIS C2 is, did the agency contact a physician or physician designee by midnight of the next calendar day and complete prescribed or recommended actions in response to the identified potential clinically significant medication issues. 
So those are the changes that have been made. This is what the question will look like for you on the form for medication follow-up. <clears throat> Was the physician or physician designee contacted within one calendar day to resolve clinically significant medication issues, including reconciliation? <clears throat> and your choices are simply yes or no. And here you have the current language by midnight of the next calendar day. It does change the time frame, and you want to be sure that you are using the correct time frame when you're answering this question. <clears throat> and then it says, and complete prescribed or recommended actions in response to the identified potential clinically significant medication issue. And we're going to talk about a little more in detail about what that means, the completing the prescribed or recommended actions. Because that doesn't always mean that every piece of the order has to be completed within that time frame. It depends upon the situation and what the order actually is. <clears throat> so the overview of the changes reminds us, within one calendar day, has been clarified to say by midnight of the next calendar day, which is much easier to follow. All issues are labeled as potential clinically significant medication issues so that we are consistent across the way. Physician contact and completion of prescribed recommended actions are required. <clears throat> so it's both the contact and the completion. So what are we trying to accomplish with this particular question? We are identifying here if a potential clinically significant medication issue identified through the review, if these were addressed with the physician or designee by midnight of the next calendar day following the identification of the issue. The complete drug regimen review and identification of medication issues are medication management best practices in the healthcare setting. And certainly, although we are doing, we are answering this question at start of care and resumption of care, the previous slide indicated this is a medication best practice. And obviously, medication best practice encourages us to reconcile medications, validate the adherence to the regimen on a very frequent, regular basis, not limited to sock and rock. Contact with that physician is defined as communication to the physician or physician designee that is made by a variety of different sources. Certainly a telephone call, leaving a voicemail, by electronic means, email, e-fax, any other means that appropriately conveys the message of the patient's status. The communication can be di made directly from the physician to or from the physician or the physician designee, or it can be done indirectly through physician office staff on behalf of the physician or physician designee, but it must be in accordance with the legal scope of practice for the person with whom you are speaking. So you do want to be very clear about who it is you're speaking to, what their designation is, and you need to know it is your responsibility to know what the limitations of their scope of practice might be. Let's take a look at the actual responses and how you're going to go about answering those. You're going to look at your choices. You have either a yes or a no, and you're going to Complete this if you have said yes in 2001. To enter response number one, yes. 
the two-way communication and completion of the prescribed recommended actions must have occurred by midnight of the next calendar day after the clinically significant issue was identified. So that means to say yes to this question, you've identified the clinically significant medication issue. You've reached out to the physician or designee by whatever means was most appropriate, most expeditious, most likely to get a response. And you have completed the prescribed or recommended actions. You cannot complete the prescribed and recommended actions if you haven't had a response. All right? So you do want to make sure you understand how you're answering this question. If the physician or designee recommends an action that will take longer than midnight of tomorrow, the next calendar day, then you can say yes, that you completed the action by midnight of the next calendar day, as long as you have done everything that was possible to do within that time frame of the recommended action. <clears throat> For instance, let's take as an example from our previous question, the patient who had both aspirin and warfarin already having nosebleeds. You've contact, identified a spe the specific example. You've identified the issue. You know that it's pressing. So you have contacted the physician and or designee. The physician and or designee has said to you, you're going to make the following medication changes for today, tomorrow, and the day after that. And on day three, you're going to obtain a PTINR, and you're going to call me, and we'll make a plan. Clearly, that runs over three days, but you can, can't get all of that done by midnight of the next calendar day. But you will have done the dosage change for the, that next calendar day, and you will have instructed the patient for the coming days, and you will have either booked or planned to do the PTINR. So you will have completed, as this says, you will have completed whatever actions are possible to complete by midnight of the next calendar day and made an appropriate plan going forward. That enables you to answer that as yes. <clears throat> so that the examples that you are given here for actions that might take longer than midnight of the next calendar day might include where the physician instruction to the agency staff is to continue to monitor the situation over the weekend and call if there's a problem. The physician instructs the patient to address the concern with his own primary physician on a visit that is already scheduled. The actual type of actions recommended should be considered when you're determining whether or not you've completed whatever is possible to complete by the next calendar day. This also answers the question of that admission that occurs on Friday afternoon after hours, or Saturday, or the eve of a holiday, or the holiday itself. Because when you are making that call, and you're getting the covering physician, the physician designee. You're going to do whatever actions are possible to be done, even if that action is inaction. If the response is, you'll need to speak to the primary physician on Monday morning. Okay, fine. You're sending him that order that says, Observe and report to primary MD on Monday. Because that's the instruction you were given, and that's what you're going to complete, and now you're going to answer the question, yes, I did that. Because that was the most that you could do, and that is the response that you got, which you are then following through on. If the physician or physician designee offers no new orders or instruction, you would enter yes, indicating that the physician or designee was contacted and the prescribed or recommended actions were completed. The instruction was observe and that's it. 
And so you are doing that. When multiple clinically significant medication issues are identified at, st at start or resumption, they all must be communicated to the physician or designee with completion of all prescribed recommended actions occurring by midnight of the next calendar day in order to answer yes. If you have identified multiple issues, particularly in the situation where you have multiple physicians, you could very well call physician A, report all of the issues to that person, who then says to you, for my part, do A, B, and C. But for D, you're going to have to go call this other doctor. If, in fact, you have contacted that other physician and gotten a response back with instruction, you can now answer yes, because you've resolved all of those issues. If you contact the first physician and you give him all four issues that you've identified, he answers three of them and forgets to address the fourth one. And you don't catch that in order to have it addressed by midnight of the next calendar day, then you cannot say yes, because you've missed one. They have not all been addressed and resolved. So that is what this is telling you. If there are multiple issues, all must be communicated with completion of all prescribed or recommended actions in order for you to say yes. If two issues are identified at Sock Rock, they both are communicated to the physician or designee in a timely fashion, and the designee, physician or designee, has given you an action for each issue, then you say yes if both recommended actions are completed by the next calendar day. That's the example that I gave you. If both recommended actions could have been addressed by midnight of the next calendar day, but only one was, then the answer is zero or no. Because whatever was ordered must be completed to the extent that it can be within the, the time frame that is stipulated. If the potential clinically significant issue was identified, the clinician attempted to communicate with the physician or designee, but did not receive a communication back from the physician or the designee until after midnight of the next calendar day, you must answer zero or no. And yes, I know, you did your part. You identified the issue, you notified the physician, but they didn't get back to you within the time frame. You still need to answer the question correctly that no, you were not able to have the two-way communication completed. If agency staff other than the clinician who completed the Sock Rock Oasis is the one contacting the physician or designee to follow up on those issues, this information has to be communicated to the clinician responsible for completing the OASIS so that the appropriate response can be entered. This collaboration between the clinician who reaches out to the physician to report what was found and to re bring back to the clinician responsible for the OASIS the re answer and the order from the physician that collaboration does not violate the requirement that the comprehensive assessment is the responsibility and must ultimately be completed by one assigned clinician. But this collaboration does not violate that. It's perfectly acceptable for you to do that in a tandem in that way. A dash is permitted. It's a valid response. It indicates no information was available and the item could not be assessed. This is most often occurring when the patient is unexpectedly transferred, discharged, or dies before the assessment could be completed. However, providers are expected to complete the transfer and discharge assessments 
to the best of their ability when a care episode ends unexpectedly. This should be a rare occurrence because the expectation is that you're going to complete the transfer and discharge to the best of your ability based on the knowledge and information available to you. So where do you find that information? Where are you identifying the issue, communicating it to the physician, and then completing the action? You'll find the information in the clinical record, the assessment note, communication notes, plan of care, the med list, and the documentation of that collaboration with other agency staff responsible for completing a portion of the drug regimen review. So let's get out those clickers again and have a crack at this first scenario. We'll see how we do. During the start of care comprehensive assessment, the RN completes a drug review and identifies that the patient is taking two antihypertensives, one that was newly prescribed during her recent hospital stay and another that she was taking prior to her hospitalization. During the home visit, the RN contacts the physician's office and leaves a message with the office staff providing notification of the potential duplicative drug therapy and requesting clarification. The next day, the RN returns to the home to complete her comprehensive assessment and again contacts the physician from the patient's home. The patient's office nurse reports to the agency and the patient the physician would like the patient to complete, continue with only the newly prescribed antihypertensive and discontinue the previous medication. Okay, we've got all the particulars. So, how are we going to respond to 2003? Are we going to enter the response zero, no? Are we going to answer the response one, yes? or the dash. Remember what the question is and what the answers mean. The question is, did you identify an issue, communicate it, and get a response back that you could complete by midnight of the next calendar day? So what would you like to answer here? A, B, or C? Are we all set? Look at that. Everybody's awake after lunch. Yay. So the intent and the rationale for this is because the issue was identified by the clinician as clinically significant with the duplicative therapy requiring physician contact by midnight of the next day, it met the criteria for 2001. As the clinically significant issue was resolved by the physician contact, response, and completion of the prescribed action by midnight of the next day, the criteria for 2003 has also been met. Let's try another one. During the comprehensive assessment visit, the RN completes the drug review and identifies that the patient is taking an anticoagulant and low-dose aspirin. During the visit, the physician's office, the nurse calls the physician's office and leaves a message with the staff providing notification of the potential drug interaction with these two medications and requests a clarification of the medication regimen. The physician does not return the phone call until after midnight of the next calendar day. How would you respond to 2003 this time? Would we select response zero, no? Would we enter response one, yes? Would we enter a dash? Remember, the nurse did reach out. She identified the issue and she reached out but the response back was not received until after midnight of the next calendar day. So select your answer. 
And let's see, look at that, 97%. We have at least one or two people who wanted to put a dash in here. The correct answer is no. And the reason for that is because while the nurse did notify the physician of the clinically significant issue, she did not receive the response back by midnight of the next calendar day. It was outside the timeliness parameter, so therefore the correct answer for 2003 has to be no. Okay, let's try another one. During the comprehensive assessment visit, the RN identifies that the patient's medication regimen review includes an antihypertensive medication. His current blood pressure is 136 over 78. The patient reports that he sometimes feels dizzy when he stands up. The RN calls the physician's office to report the patient's symptoms. The physician instructs the RN to reassess the patient daily for two days, call if the symptoms continue. The RN makes the two additional visits as ordered. The patient's symptoms resolved and the blood pressure remains stable. So look at the com significant components to this particular scenario. The issue is identified, the nurse makes the call, the physician gives orders, the orders extend out over two days. So how would you answer this one? Is the answer zero, no? Is the answer yes? Or do we want a dash here? Again, remember the parameters of what you are being asked. Was the issue identified? Was the physician contacted? Was an order received? And was it completed as best it could be within the time frame of midnight of the next calendar day. Okay, so select your answer. Oh, I hear discussion this time. Good. You want to think this one through. Okie doke. Well, we have a couple of people who think the answer would be no. And I'll bet we can figure out why. It's the length of the order. The correct answer, though, is yes. Let's look at the explanation. The explanation for the answer being yes is that issues were found during the review. The nurse contacted the physician within the time frame. All of the orders could not be completed by the end of the next calendar day. The physician did get back to her timely. He gave her the orders for two visits daily, two consecutive days, and a request for the blood pressures to be, for him to be notified if there were an issue. These orders could not be completed by midnight of the next calendar day. However, the RN did complete step by step everything that could be done by midnight of, the next ca of that calendar day. So therefore, the answer is yes, because as much as could have been done was done. And that's an important piece that you do want to remember. You don't want to get caught up and say no to this question when, in fact, the physician responded and your clinician did, in fact, do as much as they could do within the constraints of time. Okay, let's look at the third question in our series, 2005. Did the agency contact and complete physician or physician designee prescribed recommended actions by midnight of the next calendar day each time that a potential clinically significant medication issue were identified since the sock rock? Okay, so now I am not just looking at Here's my start of care or my resumption of care that I did today. And did I get or call the physician, get a response, and do what I was supposed to do by midnight of tomorrow? I'm looking at more than just today. I have to look at 
each time since the sock rock was done. Let's take a look side by side at C1 and C2 so that we can understand clearly what's being asked of us here. The old C1, <clears throat> and it does sound funny to say that, 2004 asked us if there were any clinically significant medication issues at the time of or any time since the previous OASIS assessment, was a physician or the physician designee contacted within one calendar day to resolve any identified clinically significant medication issues, including reconciliation. Just reading it, it sounds confusing. Let's see if we did any better with C2. Did the agency contact and complete physician or physician designee prescribed and recommended actions by midnight of the next calendar day each time the potential clinically significant medication issues were identified since the sock rock. Okay, it's a little shorter. Here's your question. Here's the old one, exactly as I just read it to you. And here's your new one. What you're looking at here is in the old one, you had a choice of yes, no, or not applicable. And here, you've got the same three options. What changed? In OASIS C2, physician contact and completion of the prescribed recommended actions are required. Each time issues were identified was added to the question. Within one calendar day, was revised to read by midnight of the next calendar day. Since the previous OASIS generic was changed to since the sock rock. A response was included for those patients not taking any medications at all. Those are significant. That's five different changes were made in that one question. The purpose behind this is to identify whether or not the potential clinically significant medication issues, such as an adverse effect or a drug reaction, that were identified at the time of or any time since the SOC or ROC were addressed with the physician or physician designee. So we are including the window of time because obviously it's a clinical best practice that you should be doing the medication review with your patient, with their caregiver, with whomever's responsible on a regular basis. You're not just doing it at start and resumption. The clinical best practice is that you do this on a regular basis. So now in 2005, you are being asked, did you identify, respond to, and complete the actions each time that this occurred? When do you answer this question? <clears throat> we are looking at answering this question at the time of a transfer to an inpatient facility, a death at home, a discharge from the agency, not to an inpatient facility. So if we go back to the analogy that I gave you yesterday, we are looking at answering this question in terms of a review of that quality episode, either from the most, that start of care assessment to this end point, which is the transfer to inpatient, the death at home, or the discharge, not to an inpatient facility. That's a, a closed episode there, a quality episode. You need to look at that time frame to see each time something came up, did I respond appropriately? Now I've got another one. 
So if you had, in the course of care for this patient, a start of care and a transfer to an inpatient facility, and five days later, a resumption of care, and many days later, a discharge. You're going to each time at the transfer to the inpatient facility, from the start to that transfer, from the resumption to the ultimate discharge, you need to look at that span in order to answer the question. So that you are essentially, if the clinician is answering this question, filling out this OASIS assessment, we're essentially telling that clinician, now go back and audit your own record. Take a look and make sure you did respond appropriately as you should have. So there's the way the question looks on your form with your options for your answers. To answer, to check off response number one, yes. The two-way communication to the physician received back from the physician, and completion of the prescribed and recommended actions must have occurred by midnight of the next calendar day each time that a potential clinically significant issue was identified. So if the physician or his designee recommends an action that will take longer than that allowed time to complete, you can still say yes, as long as by midnight of the next calendar day, your clinician has done as much as physically can be done in that time period to comply with the recommended action or the orders they were given. Even if the recommended action is in action to observe and report or wait two days until Monday and call the, the primary physician, they are still completing the action they were instructed to do. When that potential clinically significant issue was identified, if the physician or the designee gave you no new orders or instruction, you're still saying yes because you're indicating that they were contacted and the response, again, even if the response is not to do anything new, you just, okay, you told me, fine. You've done what you needed to do. And so you can say yes in that situation. As in the previous question, each time that there are multiple clinically significant medication issues, once these have all been identified, they all must be communicated to the physician or physician designee. And they must have completion of all the prescribed and recommended actions by midnight of the next calendar day in order for you to say yes. Remembering always that even if the action is no action, you have still done the reporting and followed through on what you were instructed to do. If any potential clinically significant medication issue was identified at the time of or any time since the start or resumption of care and was not both communicated and addressed by completing the recommended actions, you have to say no. That's why what I'm saying to you is you have to go back and look at that time span from start of care to perhaps the transfer or the discharge, from the resumption to another transfer or to the ultimate discharge. That's what you need to look at, is that time span. If there were other issues, then you need to look at them to see, did I notify the physician or designee, and did I get an, a response, and did I complete the response? That needs to be looked at for that time span, not just the sock rock assessment alone in a vacuum, but that whole time span. So that if any occurred and all parts of the equation were not fulfilled, then the answer does have to be no. If the last assessment done was the sock or rock, 
and a clinically significant issue was identified at that soccer rock, the issue is reported at both the start or resumption assessment on 2003 and again on the transfer death or discharge on 2005 because the time frame you are looking at is now at the time of or any time since the initial, that sock or rock assessment. So remembering my window analogy, we are looking at a left bracket and a right bracket, whichever one they may be, and you want to consider now the whole span in between. Remember which OASIS assessments we are talking about here. What if you had done a start of care, you've done a research, and then halfway through the second episode, now we have a transfer. Now you are looking at reviewing 12 weeks before you can answer 2005. Because the terms of this question are for you to go back to that start or resumption. So in that case, you would have to do all of that first episode plus the portion of the second to go from start to transfer. The patient comes back to you five days later and then is discharged. You only have from the resumption for maybe three weeks now to the discharge. And so that's a very short time period. But your parameter is the start or resumption, and on the end side, the transfer, death, or discharge. So I want to be sure that you understand the time frame that you are looking at before you can answer 2005. The use of the dash, <clears throat> the value and the answers are the same. The dash value is still a valid response for this item. It indicates that no information was available or it simply could not be assessed. As before, this is most often when the patient is unexpectedly transferred, discharged, or dies before the assessment could be completed. However, you should complete your transfer and discharge assessments to the best of your ability when the care episode ends unexpectedly. This should be a rare occurrence that you have no information or you cannot assess it. It's appropriate for you to use the information you have available to go through the time frame that's available for review in order to answer the question and answer it to the best of your ability before resorting to the dash. As I said before, for 2001 and 2003, your data is available in your clinical record itself. Make sure that you look at communication notes and please make good use of the care coordination and communication notes in your electronic record or in your paper file if that's what you're using. I would be especially concerned about how you are tracking and documenting any care communication, care coordination, communication to and from physician that occurs after hours. If you are electronic, I would be very sure that your extended hours staff have access and are completing this documentation immediately. Because for patient safety, you have got to get this information back and forth between staff and to and from the physician office or designee and to your staff. So using these communication notes, the care coordination notes, whatever mechanism you have, you need to be sure that your staff know how to use it and they are using it. Great topic for a quick 10 minutes of a staff meeting so that people bring their laptops in, their tablets, whatever you're using, and you demo it with them. Give these examples. They're good examples because these things do happen after hours and you really want them included and addressed. You'll find information on the medication list. Assuming that your staff are regularly and religiously updating the med profile, 
if you need a quick guide to where to look to see if there were medication issues that resulted in new medication orders, then it would certainly be helpful to go to the med profile, the med regimen list, and quickly look down to see since the start of care or the resumption, what changes were made. And then you can quickly go back to just those notes to see what happened. This happened, the call was made, did the, con the response come back, did we act within the time frame? There are lots of different ways that you can go about teaching your staff to do this before they answer the question. But please don't let them push it off on you. If they are doing the care, they need to be the one doing this. They need to talk to each other. They need to make this part of the plan of care, a medication best practice, that they review the medications on a regular basis as a frequent, continuous, quality part of their visits and their assessments. They need to talk to each other. Those communication and care coordination notes are critical because off our staff, other disciplines are going to be involved in medication issues. It could be the therapist who identifies that the pain medication's just not cutting the mustard. They're taking it 45 minutes before the therapy session and they can't complete the session because they're in pain. We have a, med, a significant medication issue. If the therapist takes care of it and the clinician, the nurse clinician comes in following that and isn't aware that the change in medication's been made, you've got a problem. And so you need to be sure that the communication is happening and that they are fully aware of what everyone's doing. So that said, let's take a look at a practice scenario. During the start of care comprehensive assessment, the RN completes the drug regimen review and identifies a potential clinically significant medication issue. On that day of admission, the RN calls, leaves a message with the physician office related to that medication issue. The physician does not return her call until after midnight of the next calendar day. No other medication issues arise during this episode of care, and the patient is discharged from home health. Okay? Read it carefully. Identify what are the parameters, what are the tags that you're looking for here. Was an issue identified? Was the physician notified? Did the two-way occur before midnight of the next calendar day? That, and were the actions completed? So you need all of those in order to answer this question. On start of care, how would you respond to 2001? Zero no, no issues were found during the review. Yes, issues were found during the review. C, not applicable. The patient is not taking any medications or put in that dash. Remember what question you're answering here. This is the first question, 2001. Okay, if you got your clickers, let's all pick one. Are you saying no issues? Yes, issues were found. Patient's not taking any meds, or are you using the dash? Are we all done? Yep, okay, let's see how we did. Ah, 88% are picking B, but there's a small group that think there were no issues found during that review. And the correct answer is yes, issues were found during the review. Let's analyze this a bit and see why. Well, I guess we're going to answer 2003 first. What would be the answer here? What are we asking in 2003? Bless you. We are asking whether or not issues were found and was the physician contacted? Zero no, one yes, or the dash? Okay, we have every, make sure you've all answered. Whoa, we have a two-thirds, one-third split here this time. Two-thirds are saying the answer's no. One-third is saying the answer's yes. 
And the correct answer is no, because the physician did not get back to her within the time frame. She identified the issue, she notified, but there was no response by midnight of the next calendar day. Now, we're discharging this episode. How are we going to respond to 2005? Are we saying no? There were no issues found. Nothing occurred that needed to be notified the physician and actions taken. What about yes? An issue occurred. And we're talking about start of care and through to discharge. Or is it not applicable? We're not taking any meds here. Or are we using the dash? We're back to two-thirds and one-third. And the correct answer is no. Let's see the reasons why. On start of care, issues were found during the review for 2001. On 2003, the physician did not get back to her timely. On 2005, the physician did not get back to her timely on start of care. And even though there were no other in new issues between start and discharge, you still have to include the start of care one. And since the physician did not respond to her, she was not able to speak with him before midnight of the next day and complete the actions. So here's the explanation. Because an issue identified was determined by the clinician to be clinically significant, requiring physician contact by midnight of the next calendar day, it meets the criteria for a potentially clinical, clinically significant medication issue. Therefore, we answer yes for 2001. Now, while the clinician had initiated the communication with the physician, the required two-way conversation did not occur until after midnight of the next calendar day, resulting in zero no for 2003 and 2005 on discharge. Because we did not have that two-way communication, there was no way she could have completed prescribed actions by midnight of the next calendar day because she didn't even get a hold of the doctor until then. Okay, let's try it again. I want to see if we can get that other third to move over and we'll get 100% this time. These are not easy questions. And it can be confusing because you have multiple moving parts that you are evaluating in order to correctly answer this question. And that's why I'm taking the time to go through this slowly to make sure that we are all understanding the rationale behind what we're saying. During the discharge assessment, the RN reviews the patient's medication list and confirms that no potential clinically significant medication issues are present. In reviewing the clinical record, there is documentation that a drug regimen review was conducted earlier in the episode and no potential clinically significant medication issues were identified then. There is no other documentation to indicate that potential clinically significant medication issues occurred during this whole episode of care from either start or resumption to the discharge that this nurse is conducting. Okay, remember all of your components, and we're going to go through all three of those questions. At discharge, how are you responding to 2005? Are you saying response zero, no? Are you saying response one, yes? Are you saying nine, not applicable? Or are you using a dash? Take your clicker, select one of those answers, and remember the content of your scenario here. 
There were no issues identified on discharge, and the record audit indicates that there were none prior. Oh, my. We're all over here. We have a little less than two-thirds who are saying this is not applicable. Not applicable means the patient was not taking any medications. All right, let's go back. Let's go back. Here we are. Look at the, look at the scenario. During the discharge assessment visit, the RN reviews the patient's medication list confirms that no potential clinically significant medication issues are present. In reviewing the clinical record, there is documentation that a drug regimen review was conducted earlier in the episode and no potential clinically significant issues were identified. There is no other documentation to indicate potential clinically significant medication issues occurred during this episode. Okay, there were the options. Okay. So now, NA, there were no clinically significant medication issues. We looked for potential clinically significant issues via completion of a drug regimen review and none were found. So the yes and no answers are incorrect. And we have quite a number of people Again, at least a third who are confused and are looking to say either yes or no. We had an issue and either yes, we got a response back and completed the actions or no, there was an issue, but we didn't get a response. And that's not correct. You want to be sure you understand exactly what it is you're answering when you make a selection. Let's try one more. During the start of care comprehensive assessment, the RN completing the drug regimen review identified a clinically significant issue, contacted the physician, resolved the issue by midnight of the next calendar day. On day 35 of the episode, the patient is transferred to acute care. Home care services resume on day 40. The resumption of care assessment identified no clinically significant medication issues. During the discharge assessment visit, the RN reviewing the patient's medication list finds no potentially clinically significant medication issues. Let's look at this carefully. We need to break this down into its component parts. And remember very carefully how the question is worded. How would you respond to 2005? Is the response zero no? Is it one yes? Is it not applicable? Are we using the dash? Two-thirds, one-third. We still have some confusion, but two-thirds of you are answering it correctly. Let's go back now and look at the rationale. There was one clinically significant medication issue identified by the RN at start of care. It was resolved by midnight of the next calendar day using the required two-way communication. There were no clinically significant medication issues from resumption to discharge. We only considered the time period from resumption to discharge when we are coding this scenario. That's where the confusion lies. Okay? I want to go back to the, re to the description of the scenario itself. Remember yesterday when we talked about the definition of the quality episode. 2005 reads, from start or resumption. When you look at this scenario as it is written, 
it clearly defines two separate quality episodes. Start of care and the end bracket is your transfer on day 35. When that transfer was done, the answer to 2005, which is answered on transfer, the answer there would have acknowledged, yes, there was a medication clinically significant issue. And yes, the two-way communication occurred and the issue was resolved. Now I'm looking at resumption to discharge, and I am only looking at that piece. And it says here in our scenario that there were no potentially clinically significant medication issues identified, which didn't, so there was no need for a communication or a response. Because we are only looking at the second quality episode, that's the reason why the correct answer is that there were none. It's not applicable here because we are only looking at the second quality episode. I knew that that might be confusing, and I do believe that's the confusion for those people, the one-third of our group who answered this incorrectly. That's why I wanted to go back and look at the scenario itself again and be sure we understand we are talking about two separate episodes here, two separate quality episodes. Okay. 2001, 2003, and 2005 are included in the calculation of the drug regimen review conducted with follow-up for identified issues quality measure. A drug regimen review as completed at start of care and at resumption of care to identify any potential or actual clinically significant medication issues. The follow-up, 2003, is completed at SOC Rock to determine if issues identified in 2001 were in fact addressed with the physician or designee by midnight of the next calendar day. Medication intervention, 2005, is completed at the transfer, death at home, or discharge to identify if medication issues identified at the time of or any time since that start of care or resumption of care were addressed with the physician or the physician designee. So these are three different questions. We are looking at the medication review. Did we identify an issue? We're looking at medication follow-up in 2003 and the intervention in 2005. Three different pieces here. So now we have to think about creating an action plan. How are we going to go about teaching this to our clinical staff? What are the steps you might take? What are the teaching tools that you might want to use? How are you going to help them by crafting policies and procedures for drug regimen review, medication follow-up, and medication intervention so that your clinicians will clearly understand the distinctions between each one of them so they will not end up in your office two-thirds right, one-third confused. I mean, if we're struggling, and we've been working on this over the last hour and a half together, think about trying to teach this to your clinical staff in 20 or 30 minutes in a staff meeting. You need a really strong action plan. You need really clear policy, process, teaching tools, competency tools, to be sure that this is going to work. You want to practice coding a variety of different scenarios with your staff in order to make sure that they do have a solid understanding of each of the three questions and what zero, yes, and no means for each of them. 
What is the difference? What is the definition of yes, no, or not applicable in each of these questions? That's a very important thing. You might want to conclude a review of these three specific items as part of your annual quality perf improvement performance plan. It's a very good idea to review this as part of quarterly audit, as part of your annual plan. The new COPs and the quality improvement piece doesn't start till January. And even when it does, getting this right reducing the incidence of medication issues or adverse drug events, that's a very important improvement plan and very appropriate for study under the new conditions. So look at this, develop an action plan for now to be sure that your staff are doing this correctly since it's already here. And then look at how you're going to audit and reinforce this on an ongoing basis. We have the usual culprits for resources. These are all active hyperlinks. You can take a look at them, use them, but I cannot emphasize enough. Look at how you're going to develop your action plan, your training tools, your education, and your auditing to be sure that people understand this. And above all else, make sure that your staff understands. You went to training. You don't have to fess up which group you were in. Just tell them. There were 250 people in the room. Two-thirds got it right, one-third got it wrong, and they're all quality managers and managers. So this is hard to understand. It's okay. It's cool with me. Let's sit down and figure out this together. They'll respond much better when the culture you're presenting it in is, Let's, we're in this together. Let's all figure it out together. And that's what I hope we've been doing this afternoon, is figuring out together. So if you have any questions, I'll do my best to figure them out with you. Okay, we have about 10 minutes for questions, and then I'm going to move out the way between you and the coffee pot. Does anyone have any questions? Oh, I see somebody's already primed up. I hope I can answer it. Resource. Sorry, there. I appreciate the training and resources that have been provided to help us with encoding the OASIS. And shooting for outcomes is very imperative. I get that. On that note, what means of physician education for the response by midnight and means for ensuring compliance is being accomplished? OK. <laughs> First of all, let's not shoot the messenger, okay, guys? <laughs> I'm just standing up here teaching it. Um, understand, please, that this is really not a gotcha. That is not the point here. It is not a gotcha to say, well, you screwed up. The idea is, if something occurs... If an adverse event did occur, you would be able to go back and say, okay, I looked at this record, and my root cause analysis of this incident is, we in fact identified the issue timely, we in fact contacted the physician, not once but twice, whatever you did, and he, she, and or their designee failed to respond to my contacts. And that's all you can do. You're simply, you're documenting what you did. You're documenting what somebody else did or didn't do. That is not my understanding. We're simply documenting what happened. We're trying to determine what it is that might be causing a readmission. It's a quality measure. Obviously, the quality of care has to be worked on from both sides. And so it's important. And, you know, all that does is help you to identify, okay, so I'm having a little difficulty with certain physicians getting my responses back. And then you need to think about how am I going to act on that? Is there an action plan that I can make to try to reach out to them, to try to get the responses back? Ask them how better can I communicate so that I can get an answer back? Is it the way I'm phrasing it on my facts that I'm sending over? 
There are some things you can do. But it's, it, to the best of my understanding, this is not a gotcha. Yes, ma'am. I'm going to follow up with this, because I think there's probably mm, at least two-thirds of the people in this room who are thinking like I am, um, that, you know, most of the time, physicians don't respond in a timely manner, more on the exception than the rule that they do. So I don't know about anybody else, but if my clinicians are doing their part, we still end up being penalized on the quality of care part. And, you know, I'm seeing heads nod, so I know I'm not the only one thinking this. So our quality measures drop. They do. So even though we're doing everything we can possibly do, and believe me, I made the phone calls. I've sent the fact stating mm -hmm. I've made four phone calls, and you didn't respond to that, so here's my facts. And we appreciate that many of our physicians are very busy and don't have the time or the resources always to respond to us. So I guess my overlying question is, will CMS or can you let CMS know that it's really important that you take all of these pieces and why our feet are being held to the fire and we are trying to do our part, mm -hmm. if we can't do our part to be penalized for quality of care, which we are all trying to deliver, but we can't deliver it without that other piece and the response mm -hmm. that we're supposed to get. Right, because it is a two-way communication. Mm -hmm. And I, I hear what you're saying. What I will do is, I, what I will say to you is, CMS is here with us. We will add it to our list. We will have a conversation. It is unlikely we're going to be able to get back to you by the end of the day, but it's certainly, we will try to get you something um, or someone you can speak to directly. But it's obviously not a question that I myself can answer you directly. But I will certainly take it back to those who are here with us from CMS today, and we'll see where we can go to hopefully get you at least some kind of an answer. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I just want to find out, when we're talking about the physicians, does emergency room count? Like, let's say you have a patient, you do the medication um, review, and you find out there's really something that needs to be taken care of right away. The physicians cannot call you back. You send the patient to the emergency room. Does that count as, you know, reporting and getting a response, or are you still going to get penalized for that? You're going to need to look. If you're sending them to the emergency room, you're going to need to, you're doing a transfer. And so you're going to need to answer that question on the transfer. If you couldn't wait then the information's not available to you, is it? Because the tw that period of time before midnight of the next calendar day hasn't expired, okay? What I will do is I want to confirm that with my colleagues to be sure that I'm guiding you correctly so you will get a response from the group. But at the moment, that would be my instinct if you are transferring them to the emergency room and doing the transfer oasis before the time period has expired. You know. Then you will have gotten orders from that emergency room physician, a physician or designee, and you would answer it accordingly then, which does fall inside the time period. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I want to make sure that we beat this horse dead, okay? Um, we run into this all the time. Our primary care physicians, since the birth of hospitalists, do not take call. So we have our patients being discharged from acute care. The hospitalist clocks out at 8 o'clock the next morning. Uh, we are on a weekend. The physicians absolutely do not respond to our phone calls. Um, so talk about unrealistic goals that we are, uh, that are set up for home health agencies. This is a big one. And I have visited with our primary care physicians. I'm going to just say it. We've got, uh, there is a large crop of millennials, and um, they are done at noon on Friday. 
and they don't answer their phones. But we have to have a two-way communication with someone. Who okay, is but it? they signed out to the hospitalist for over the weekend or overnight. Is no. that what I'm understanding? No, these are primary care physicians. They work in their clinics. Uh, there is very poor communication, I find, uh, between hospitalists and primary care physicians. And um, I, I know okay, that's Okay, but not what I'm asking you is, have, can you map out the train of responsibility? If the physician, the primary physician, is located in a hospital-based clinic, or hosp you know, it's, it's there on, in that, within that facility's purview, when they sign out at 5 o'clock, clinic's closed, I'm going home. Who is responsible for their patient? There must be someone. <laughs> yeah, no. No, there okay, absolutely but, is not. I've had the conversations with them. Okay, there is so what they're saying to you then is that there's no one covering? Absolutely. I have been told, uh, don't call me on Saturday. I'll be at the lake. I'll be five deep into the six-pack. I'm not answering any questions. Okay, Literally. there must be an instruction. They are giving the patients. Who is the patient supposed to call? ER. Absolutely ER. They are instructed to go to the emergency room. Okay, I'm going to defer that one to my CMS colleagues. We will put our heads together and come up with something for you. Anyone else? We have time for maybe one more. I'm sorry, just to follow up. Here's my thought. Are the physicians ever going to have a data set that we can put this question on so they're held accountable to their side of it? I mean, I don't know if that's something CMS has thought about. Right. I don't know if it is, but we can certainly ask. Okay. Oh, I have one more here. Do I have time, Anne? I think I do for one more. One more. Last Poss one. Possibly just a comment. Uh, one of those situations we did, it would, you know, one of the things we have to do is decide whether the situation rises to the level that we must contact the physician, you know, by mm -hmm. midnight the next calendar day. At least one of those situations we talked about. I would say we don't we didn't need we could do some things ourselves to see you know we mm -hmm. need to do the drug interactions it was one of the, one of the ones with the herbals and that gives us a little bit more time to decide whether it really rises to that level and but if we're calling the physician for every single thing we find they're not going to call us back that we we have to make that clinical decision first when yes. it rises to the level that we have to call the physician. And I agree with you there. What, I am what I'm saying to you is the same thing that I have said all along here. And that is, in order to make that clinical judgment as to whether or not this particular situation rises to the level of a potential clinically significant medication issue that requires the notification and or intervention by that within that time frame, you need a, an appropriate validated resource with which to supplement your clinical judgment. In other words, what is it that you're using to make that judgment? Have you researched something so that now you're saying, okay, I run an interaction program in my EMR and it says there's a very low risk for this, or there's a medium risk for a food to drug interaction. You need to have parameters, you need a policy that says, in the case of A, I'm going to do this, in the case of B, we're going to do that, and you need to set some guidance. But you need an appropriate validated resource with which to guide that judgment. I agree with you. It does say exercising sound clinical judgment. You need some kind of a resource with which to support that judgment. And then I think you would be able to craft some kind of a policy, and that should be part of your action plan. Be when you go back to your office, you need to be working on that action plan. Okay, I'm going to turn the phone back over to Anne. 